Welcome to another episode of The Artsy Raven, a show about writing and publishing with your host, J.F. Garrard. Hello, welcome to The Artsy Raven. I'm your host, J.F. Garrard. And today we're going to talk about what do book reviewers do and how to avoid rejection when submitting to an anthology with Alex Carrion. Alex is an editor, writer, and literary critic from Alexandria, Virginia. He has edited and approved the anthologies Credo, an anthology of manifestos and source book for creative writing, Her Plumage, an anthology of women's writing from Quail Bell Magazine. He has had fiction, poetry, and literary reviews published in Quail Bell Magazine, of which he is a senior critic, Lambda Literary Review, Empty Mirror, Quarterly West, Whale Road Review, Gertrude Press, Hash Journal, The Blue Nib, Passionate Chick, uh, Writer's Egg Magazine, Stories About Penises, uh, Closet Cases, Queers and What We Wear, and Image Outright Volume 9. He is also a former news copy editor and currently serves as an editorial coordinator for the nonprofit, the Society of American Foresters. You can find his work on his website, kerriganak.wordpress.com, and follow him on Twitter at kerriganak, and you'll see all the links uh, at the bottom of the description of the episode. So Alex, welcome to The Artsy Raven. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. This is my first podcast, so <laughs> really excited to chat today. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in writing and editing. All right. Well, I started my writing and editing career when I went to college at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. I entered the Robertson School of Media Culture in their mass communications program at focusing on print and online journalism. So while there, I did four years of journalism courses, did all kinds of stuff there, including writing about the 2013 gubernatorial race in Virginia, and it was also there that I started working in some of the college anthologies offered from the Student Media Center, particularly Platem Literary Journal, where I, by the time I graduated, I was vice president of the organization. Um, after college, I started writing a lot of freelance work for Quail Bell Magazine, which was started in Richmond. So I kind of knew a lot of people living there at the time, but has expanded wildly to writers from all over the world. And that kind of let me get my critical feet in the water, I'd say. Mostly I started by writing movie reviews of like art films and other programs, but eventually I sort of transitioned more into literary reviews. Um, when I graduated, I also started interning with the Cambridge Writers Workshop, a nonprofit that holds literary programs and retreats and events all over the world. So I got to work with them on various programs, including their um, American and international writing retreats, I got to do some work on their social media and website work, and I also helped with some of their anthologies, like the Credo Anthology, which was published in 2018, where I helped review submissions, make editorial decisions, communicate with authors, and ultimately helped edit the manuscript with the rest of the team. So I did that a lot of for the start of my post-college years, did some part-time work, some temp work. But eventually I moved to the Washington DC area and got a job as a copy editor for a news site. Um, that allowed me to sort of turn editing into a career where I was editing stuff very quickly um, in very timely manners. It was a very fast, exciting kind of job. Unfortunately, that website um, is no longer in existence. It, you know, there was a mass layoff of pretty much everyone in the startup it was a part of. So after that, I transitioned to editing for nonprofits in the DC area. I previously worked with the American Correctional Association uh, as an associate editor, where I worked on um, items like their bi-monthly membership magazine, Corrections Today, where I got to edit articles. I got to write some articles. I also got to write book reviews for them because that was one of the sections I was in charge of. And if we couldn't find people to review, I'd be like, I'll do it. <laughs> And so that was a great position. And earlier this year, I left ACA to work for the Society of American Foresters, where now uh, my main position is helping to edit two of their academic journals, Journal of Forestry and Forest Science. So now I'm sort of in the more intense, scientific, Chicago manual style editing, but it's been a great experience so far. 
So what it sounded like you were doing print journalism, like a lot of media sort of uh, education. So I think it's almost very technical, right? It's not a creative sort of degree, but I think you've been working more on technical stuff, but then on the side, I think you do a lot more creative things. I do try to do creative things from time to time. Um, in the last few years, I've started attending some poetry workshops in Washington, DC with Split This Rock. And that has basically helped to turn me into a poet because it's every two weeks, it's only generative workshops. So I've actually been producing work, but in between I have had time to work on short stories, start and ending like other manuscript ideas. So I'm sort of hoping to eventually coalesce some things, <laughs> but otherwise I'm just, you know, doing the technical um, news journalistic work for my day job, but at night I'm still finding ways to do creative writing. So how do book reviews work? Like you do a lot of book reviews. So yeah. when you, someone gives you a book, it, it, I mean, I'm sort of thinking about movie reviews too. I guess you, you go through it and then you make notes and, like, how does that process work for you? Um, it varies from work to work. Like, I started doing book reviews just because after a while, I was getting kind of tired of doing movie reviews and television reviews. But, and I, but I also started to find book reviews a little more challenging and more in line with the kind of nonfiction writing I do, where, you know, my background with journalism school, I also got a minor in international cinema. So I definitely love, you know, taking on media and communicating, like, the merit, the value, the art artistry behind it. And I don't know, I found that really exciting to do with literature. So in the last few years, I started picking up more opportunities to do book reviews. Like, you know, how we met was, I just put a thing out on Twitter saying, hey, I'm reviewing books that are coming out at Small Fair and AWP. Reach out to me on if you want your work reviewed. And you know, before COVID, when I could actually go to these things in person, I could, you know, chat for a long time. Some tables at these events would be like, hey, we have, we have review copies, just sign up here, tell us where you'll publish it. And it was just that willingness to reach out to people. Like I had business card, I had like author business cards made for Christmas one year and took them to AWP in San Antonio last year. And so that's really it was just basically putting myself out there because a lot of these presses, they just they want people to review, like these smaller mm -hmm. indie ones, these ones that are more niche. They want people to see their work. They want the word to get out. They sometimes don't know how to reach out to people or they're not exactly sure how they would submit it. And it's sort of that willingness to just be like, you know, I have time. I can put aside like a Saturday to read your forthcoming memoir. You know, here's where I publish so you can actually vet me and know that I am a legit person and I'm not doing this just to get a free book because that anxiety is how I got like the first review of one book because I was like, well, I made that promise better review it now that I'm back home from this conference. <laughs> but yeah, I only recently discovered that people I didn't realize some people make a living from book reviews like you can get paid and stuff although not a lot but no I I am definitely not a paid book reviewer okay in the like living side like there are some places where I am a freelance writer where I do get paid for the review but for the most part I publish on places where I don't get paid so that's why you know I love my job because it gives me the income and the sustainability to where I can just be like my weekend is going to be dedicated to reviewing this new po poetry book I got in the mail the other week. And yeah. <laughs> well, you're doing truly an act of love with all your reviews. And it's really nice to uh, hear this. And you're right, like small presses are desperate for reviews. Like we don't have the same outreach as, you know, like yeah. going up to Kirkus and throwing down like 800 bucks for someone to look at our stuff. Oh, right? yeah. No, yeah. totally. And again, and it also helps because you do form that relationship where you can get further work. Like, you know, I mentioned that at AWP, there was one press that said, we have 20 copies of this book. We'll give it to you for free if you review it. So I did. I was like the first person to review the book, like four months before it was even released. It was amazing. And then next year I got emails from them saying, Hey, we have two more books coming out. Do you want to review either or both of them? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So it really helps to just keep that going because they have, they know your name, they know where you publish, you know, they'll help that website out, your website will help them. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of that 
increased scope and back and forth. And I've really enjoyed a lot of the opportunities I've gotten. Like people have sent me some really fascinating work. Yeah, but you might not even see it, right? If they don't send it to you. No, I mean, I make sure to say like, hey, it just went up. Here's the link, you know, here's my Twitter, you know, mention me. Like I, I try to, <laughs> I put it on blast everywhere. Like I'm like, my latest review in at Quail Bell Mag is of, you know, this book by at this mm -hmm. author from at this press. Like, you know, I, yeah. I definitely try to make sure enough people see it. And I know I definitely don't have the widest reach on Twitter. I'm only in the last like two years have really been trying to make an effort on that site. But, you know, people are just really happy to see, get the tag. Yeah, I mean, it's a small community. I think we're all learning about all this marketing stuff and, yeah, you know, how this works, how to grow, grow your audience, blah, blah, blah. And all those podcasts I listen to about, you know, publishing. So um, what kind of tips do you have for writers? Like, well, you read a lot of books from a book reviewer's perspective, but what do you want writers I guess, what do you want more of when you read? Yeah, well, the way I try to do reviews that I sort of learned, like this is definitely a good way to write book reviews, is sort of address what the intent of the author is and what they are trying to say or who they're trying to write for. Like, I will admit, I've read books where I did not really fall in love with them. I didn't love them, but I didn't hate them. And, you know, that comes out in the review saying like, you know, I did not really have much of a reaction to this book. However, what this book does do is it's this genre, it's got these themes, it attempts this, it didn't necessarily work for me, but it could work for you. So just even saying like, you know, I didn't really like this haunted house book. However, it's still a very good haunted house book if you are interested in haunted houses from the sort of Gen Z perspective, like that kind of thing. Like a Gen Z haunted house story about intergenerational trauma, like, you know, you may enjoy that. I didn't, but you may, so. Do you look at more literary stuff or genre stuff? Like, what do um, you? It kind of depends on what I get sent. Um, I have I have sort of connected with a few publicists and it, my name and contact info is on a few websites where I definitely do get more kinds of work than others. Like I'm on the Horror Writers Association list. So I do get a lot of horror sci-fi genre review work. So that has been very interesting because I've definitely been reading a lot of very different things there. Um, so, but, so that definitely, so I definitely do have streaks where I'm like, wow, I'm only doing genre work. I'm only doing like horror. But then when you go to larger events or when certain uh, periods happen, I start to get more general stuff. Like the majority of stuff I got from my recent AWP small fair promotion is a lot of poetry, for example. You know, I, I definitely put out there that I want to re read and review stuff that's definitely not my background as a cisgender white male. So I definitely am like, I want to read stuff by authors of color. I want to read LGBT authors. I want to read women. Like I especially make it clear I want to read women's work. So, you know, and that, and that definitely will help and affect what I do get when publicists email me. Like I, I know some publicists will send me like, hey, here's five books I'm looking for reviewers for. And I'm like, uh, okay, I'm not sure about that one, not sure about that one. Oh, hey, this one is an international anthology being published out of Canada, featuring authors from all over the world. And one of the websites I published on is an international site. So I think I will do this one because it just provided a lot for me to read, to get different styles, perspectives, theme that I could possibly pull themes out of, like, especially in larger collected works, you want to find underlying themes. And also just know like, oh, well, this is the best platform to promote it on by publishing the review. You know, I don't entirely know the reach of the site, but I could say, oh, you know, an international anthology on an international literary website that could, you know, be really interesting to tackle and to share. Very cool. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. We're going to switch gears a little bit, and why don't you tell us a bit more about this anthology anthology project you're uh, involved in, the Please Welcome to the Stage, a drag literary anthology. Like, how, where did this come from, and what okay. are you looking for? 
Okay, I'm very excited to talk about this. So back in 2017, I went on a writing retreat with the Cambridge Writers Workshop to Rockport, Massachusetts, which if you don't know, is this absolutely gorgeous coastal New England town and in autumn. So I had this absolutely wonderful time there. While there, I met another participant named Rachel Head and instantly on that trip, we had the spark of a literary friendship. Like we had a moment at a lobster roll shack in old Rockport where suddenly we realized we're gonna be best friends after this. And oh my God, I've never had a lobster roll, sorry. I'm just thinking you know, that makes my mouth water. Still really good. But, <laughs> but anyway, so Rachel and I left that retreat with the agreement that we would from there on be literary partners. Like I would edit her work, she would edit my work, we would talk, give feedback, and we would just help each other with our careers. We obviously don't get to see, we don't get to see each other much in person. I live in Virginia. She lives outside Chicago with her family. And so the few times we do get to meet are on like retreats, conferences, in person. So back in San Antonio, AWP last year, you know, it was one of the few times Rachel and I got to see each other. And we were talking about all the things we love, you know, food, drag, conference our writing, talking about our projects, things we're doing. And while we were there, we had the idea, hey, why don't we work on a book together about drag? We both, drag was the spark because we were both like, RuPaul's Drag Race is our favorite reality show. And we decided originally what we were gonna do was do a, we were gonna write a short story collection together where I would write like five stories, she would write five stories, and then we would together write like a 11th story about like the interconnected lives of a drag community, which was so fun, but eventually that kind of petered out due to real life getting in the way. So recently, Rachel and I were talking and we thought, why don't we just make this an open call anthology? Why don't we put out there, we're putting together a book about drag and we wanna see your work. So, excuse me. So this spring, we're hoping to launch our call for submissions for our anthology. Please welcome to the stage. Um, basically, what we are asking for is we are looking for poetry, fiction, nonfiction, and artwork. You can submit any genre, any style. We do have like length and format requirements that, you know, is boring. Our one requirement is that drag must be a component of your story. Now, I previously submitted to an anthology called Stories About Penises, one of the best books I've ever been published in, quite frankly. No, I have to look into that. But yeah. Oh, you absolutely should. It's amazing. Okay. And not just because I'm in it, but it, it's a fantastic book. But in their submission call, they were like, any genre, any st style can be about whatever you want. There has to be a penis in there somewhere. And that book had everything. It had comedy, it had drama, it had um, erotic, it had sci-fi, it had some really sad stories, like some really heartbreaking things in there. And it's just, you know, a piece of male anatomy was this thing that tied it all together. So we're very much looking for people's interpretation of the art of drag, because art, drag is not just men in wigs lip syncing on a stage for cash tips. You know, it's makeup, it's hair, it's comedy, it's vaudeville, it's acting, it's singing live, it's done by people straight, gay, in between, all over, it's done by cisgender, it's done by transgender, it's done by men and women, and it's done all these different ways, and we just want to see all the interpretations of that. Oh, that's so cool. I still remember lining up at an LGBTQ Toronto Film Festival and they because they had a RuPaul short film where she was a superhero <laughs> and she was running around this is so long ago oh my god it must have been 20 years ago but that was awesome I still remember it so I hopefully you'll get some superhero drag stories that'll be awesome yeah we're very excited like right now we're still at the time of this interview at least we're still preparing to launch the call and we're sort of trying to get pieces from the people who are going to be on our staff for this like I'll be reading my piece for this book. But another person submitted a story where the drag was a creative nonfiction story where they, be as a young boy, 
stood in front of their Thai Buddhist church's talent show and sang Whitney Houston. Oh, wow. And, you know, in the story, they're like, you know, he's a boy. He can't be singing a girl song. And to us, the drag was sort of this young boy channeling a gay icon like Whitney Houston and trying to emulate her on stage. So it's a very fantastic story. I, I'm, I loved it. But so we're definitely looking for people to play with that interpretation and see what they can come up with. So how many pieces are you looking for? for? Um, we haven't decided yet. Uh, obviously, it's still very early in the process. I would say just from looking at anthologies I have worked on and depending on the length of the work, I would say a good like 20 to 30. Like if we can get like between 100 and 250 pages overall, I would say that's a good sized book. But again, it really depends on the kind of work we get, the amount of work we accept, and also just eventually when we do find a publisher and an agent for this, because we're also querying for those, how, what they sort of, what they ask for, what they are looking for. Okay, but so I, really gonna... hope, I really do hope we accept more than we reject. <laughs> yeah, so you're going to put together the manuscript and then try to query it to get it traditionally published, I guess that's the plan? Yeah, my, my co-editor, Rachel, she knows a little bit more about querying editors and publishers than I do. She's done that more than I have. So she's taking the lead on that. Like I'm probably gonna be handling more of the editorial side of this project. Okay, very cool. Now, could you tell us a little bit about the piece you're going to read for us? Yes, so it is a short story that I wrote originally for a role-playing site, but then I later expanded into a full story that was published in volume nine of Image Outright. Um, it's this anthology that is published during Image Out the, from New York's largest and longest running LGBTQ film festival. I had this moment at AWP last year where one of the panels I was supposed to go to, which was about um, queer publishing, got canceled last minute. So me, at, cause Corona was canceling everything last minute during that conference. So me and like six other people went to this room expecting a panel, but we're like, oh, it got canceled, that stinks. But then we're like, oh, the room's open for an hour and a half. Let's just do it ourselves. And you know, I met, I met these great people. We all shared business cards and Twitter handles. And one of the people there was the editor of this book. So she, you know, emailed everyone a few months later saying, hey, you know, we're looking for this book. I'm editing it. And I got in. It was amazing. <laughs> so I'm very excited to share this story that I got published in this book last year. Sure, go ahead. All right. So, moment. All right. So this story is called Odessa Remembers. Um, as a fair content warning, there is some foul language, some descriptions of violence and other bits of naughtiness. So just fair warning if you are potentially triggered by those. So <clears throat> I'm Odessa Arlington and this has been Odessa Remembers. And cut. Petey said, pressing the stop button on the camera and glancing to his camera subject. Before him, seated on a wooden stool in front of a bright green canvas and surrounded by large lighting fixtures, a drag queen sat with her back straight and her legs daintily crossed, like a classic French painter was trying to capture her on his canvas. Okay, and how was that? She asked, her scratchy voice drawing out the last word. Pretty good, Petey replied, playing the footage back on the camera's monitor. You're getting these videos down to a science, but not too repetitive, right? No, not at all. Okay, good. Last thing I need is people saying I'm as formulaic as a 90s sitcom. Oh, well, don't worry, Jess, Petey said. You're not there yet. Good. The last thing Miss Odessa Arlington needs is a laugh track and a guest star rating stunt, she replied. Petey grabbed the camera, camera, prepared to remove it from the tripod when Odessa raised a hand. Hey, before I take that away, turn the camera around so I can see myself, Odessa said. You saw what you looked like before we started recording. And now I want to see myself again, Odessa insisted, pointing one of her long acrylic press-on nails to her assistant. These lights are hot, and I want to make sure my face isn't melting like a Nazi looking at the Ark of the Covenant. Come on, boo. PD nodded and stopped, trying to remove the camera. He flipped the monitor around so Odessa could admire herself. Her eyes widened, and she began to touch her right temple, right where the lace front of her cumulonimbus-shaped wig was heavily glued onto her skin. 
Oh, bitch, she slayed this video, Odessa said, pursing her lips and tilting her head, studying all the angles of her face on the tiny digital monitor. You sure did, Petey said, turning the camera back around, much to Odessa's pleasure. Petey continued to fiddle with the camera on the tripod as Odessa re reached for a can of Red Bull sitting on top of the tiny table located just off camera. She moved her large hands past the damp tissues, makeup wipes, powder puff, and tubes of half-used lip gloss that cluttered the table for her drink. She returned to her original position and took a sip from the straw as she had speared through the pot top of the can. You think this will be as good as the others? Odessa asked Petey, biting on the end of the straw with her large front teeth. Of course, Petey replied. People are gonna be shocked you actually remembered this kid. I told you, Odessa never forgets, she said, standing up and walking towards the large standing mirror in the corner of the room. It's why I still wake up at night thinking of Nora and that hideous gray and green ensemble from last year's Pride Show. Seriously, for a bitch named Nora Easter, you'd think she'd look less like a Nor'easter went through her closet. Petey chuckled as he watched Odessa check herself out in the mirror. He looked over the wig on her head that looked like she dipped cotton candy in a chocolate fountain the gold sequined cocktail dress that hugged her padded figure and ended right above her knees, and the tall shoes with heels that looked thin enough to pick locks or perform lobotomies. It was almost comical to be in the presence of such a figure, especially for the kind of work it entailed. This wasn't the sort of assistant job he expected to get right out of college. Of course, it wasn't the sort of thing anyone with a communications degree from a mid-tier university would be hoping for. PD assumed he'd go work for a television station, maybe work his way up to working the control room of a major network, but the opportunities were few and far between for someone with little real world experience and PD had left school with too much debt and no invitation to return home to his parents to consider himself too good for whatever he could find. But he had limits. He had to have the kind of job that required more brain cells and skills beyond asking customers if they wanted extra guacamole in their burrito bowls. One dull night prolonged Craigslist under the influence of a few blue moons had led him to a listing for a personal assistant. It seemed like the kind of thing anyone struggling to get by in their town would hope for. Flexible hours, traveling for work, a chance to use all of those video editing skills PD has strained his eyes and back to perfect over countless nights at school, and the promise that it would be way more exciting than anything he could find elsewhere. Naturally, he applied. He was a bit inebriated after all. PD had never heard of Odessa Arlington before he went to her studio for an interview. Some of his friends at school had mentioned her as one of the performers at a charity drag show that was held in their student center, but PD didn't really know much else. When he told his friends he had an interview with her, they had collectively flipped out and gave him the full rundown. Apparently, Ardessa Arlington was a nationally recognized drag queen and entrepreneur. She had won several drag pageants around the country, although more of her success came in her, their town, where she ran an award-winning dance studio whose teams competed all over the country. Naturally, PD was a bit intimidated when he first went to meet Odessa. He'd never met any drag queens before. He was a gay man who could respect the art, but never went out of his way to see the shows. Plus, since his friends had stuffed all this prestige and clout down his throat, he was expecting to walk into Odessa's studio a sad Anne Hathaway to her Meryl Streep. To his surprise, when he walked into her office, she wasn't wearing any of the huge wigs or gowns he had seen in any of the pictures his friends showed him. Part of him thought he'd see this glamorous soap opera villainess waiting for him by a fireplace with a martini in her hand. But instead, he found the sort of 30-something-year-old Texan you'd expect to run a landscaping service or something similar. The decorated and fabulous Odessa Arlington was sitting in a leather office chair wearing a black polo shirt, jean shorts, and tennis shoes. She had close-cropped brown hair, and her face had only minimal makeup on. This was Odessa off-duty, he quickly came to realize. And now he felt really silly expecting her to be in full drag when they met for the interview. He was allowed to call the gentleman Odessa or Miss Arlington during the interview, but she invited, and she had invited him to use whatever pronouns he wanted for her. She was presenting male, but she told him he, she didn't really care what she was called. So he stuck to the female pronouns, which she seemed charmed by, even blushing a bit. But he could see from a business degree on the wall that her real name was Blake Hoffman. But with the effervescent personality she conveyed through the interview, it almost seemed like the name on the degree was a misprint. The job was described quite simply to PD. He would develop Odessa's online presence even further than before. Since he was fresh out of school, he, convinced, he could convince her that he was on top of social media trends and platforms. He could talk about what was right and wrong about the accounts for both her drag career and her dance studio, and offer suggestions for improvements and ways to expand her reach. Part of him wondered if Odessa was just going to take the advice and kick him to the curb, but she seemed quite willing to listen, even if she seemed dumbfounded at times. But she trusted him to explain everything and showed a great interest in everything he had to say. So he figured he was doing a good job at selling himself. He got the offer a few days later, much to the joy of his friends who begged, began to hound him for chances to meet Odessa. 
on top of being a media assistant, he would get to travel with her and help her out with some of her pageants and drag performances, all on her dime, of course. He was surprised to learn how in demand Odessa was, but he could soon see why she had so many fans. As an entertainer, she was hard to ignore. Her dancing was frenetic and technically precise. She could do flips and kicks that made his muscles sore just looking at them. But when she was lip syncing to current pop songs, he could also see how entertaining she was if she handed a microphone. She could randomly talk about anything that came to mind and keep a hilarious bug-eyed pursed lip expression combined with her scratchy Southern accent the whole time they had audiences pissing themselves with laughter. With PD's help, Odessa Arlington now had a much stronger social media presence. He filmed everything he could and helped her invest in a better recording setup in her gorgeous loft apartment downtown. PD started to find himself in her home more than his own. Most of her videos were just random topics like her childhood or her weirdest hookups on the road. Still, he couldn't help but find her entertaining and his busy schedule had made the last three years quite fun. He was still scraping by at times, but he did get to travel a lot and meet interesting people. Plus, having the association with Odessa meant he got two, more action than he did in college. So he was definitely fine with that. Odessa's views and social media presence had gone up since he started. So she was willing to keep him around and just discuss new ideas with him. Okay, once I get this uploaded on the hard drive, we can start on the next video, PD told Odessa as he took the camera in his hands. He walked over to the computer desk on the far side of the room, passing the racks of clothing and wig stands that lined the walls along the way. He hooked the camera up to the computer and began to export the video file. How long will that take? Odessa asked. Uh, probably just a few minutes, he replied. So you're going to give me a few minutes to get ready for the next video? You can take as long as you need, he, PD said. Are you going to need a lot of time? Nah, she curtly replied. I'm keeping the same face. Hey, doesn't Mandy read you for that? Okay, well, if Miss Mandy Bell wants to read me for my face, I could read her for her face too, Odessa snapped back. I could just remind her that rubber cement is not a substitute for collagen if she wants to come for me. <laughs> PD chuckled. Okay, I'll make sure you have that one written down the next time you see her. Oh, thanks, hon. Petey glanced over. Odessa had removed her wig, revealing the skin-colored cap that hid her boy hair and made her way over the dress rack. Besides, this is for a good cause, she said. If she wants to read me for my charity work, I'll make sure she has a pillow and headphones on her direct flight to hell. To call what Odessa was doing charity work was a bit of a stretch, but PD could at least see why she'd be passionate about it. About a year ago, in a town a few hundred miles outside of Austin, Texas, a gay teenager named Brandon Whitley was abducted, beaten, and left for dead in the desert. There had been a large manhunt for him, but he was found dead about three days after he went missing. There had been quite an uproar about the attack. Politicians attacked one another over rhetoric, vigils and donation pages had been set up for Brandon's family, and various tributes and think pieces went up on the internet. Brandon Whitley became a national topic and it made the ensuing media circus over the trial of his killers all the more heated. After he was found dead, Odessa had asked PD to do some research into the story, looking for anything that could tell them about Brandon. He wondered why she would be so interested in the story. She was an Austin native and wouldn't have been to Brandon's town for work, so he couldn't find the personal connection. However, Odessa had been surprisingly direct and insistent that he find some information, so he got to work without complaint. PD had found quite a bit on Brandon and he compiled news articles, social media pages, and any short videos onto a file on Odessa's computer. For a queer teen in a small town, Brandon had a close circle of friends who made sure he was properly memorialized on the internet. Odessa, like many, had made her own tribute to Brandon. She made a video for her YouTube account talking about how tragic and cruel Brandon's death was. Her voice choked up throughout and a tissue constantly dabbing the area under her eyes to catch any mascara, mascara tears that fell down her face. The video included an announcement that Odessa would be hosting a tribute show for Brandon at her usual drag bar in Austin. All ticket sales and tips for the showgirls would go to the Whitley family. Odessa even performed a special number for Brandon set to Celine Dion's The Prayer, which with Odessa doing her best Celine impression in front of a screen that had photos of Brandon projected onto it. The show raised over $2,000, so Odessa had considered a good show. But then another tragedy struck, this time in Louisiana. A pair of girls who were rumored to be lovers were killed in the home of one girl while her parents were out. Shortly after that, a transgender teenage girl in Arkansas was killed walking home from her friend's house. It seemed like there was a sudden spree in LGBTQ related murders in the South. And PD had noticed that it seemed to be weirdly affecting Odessa. It was then that Odessa had brought a proposal for a new series of videos on her YouTube channel. Every time an LGBT person was murdered, Odessa insisted on making a video. She couldn't organize as many charity shows as she wanted, so she settled for doing video tributes to the deceased and setting up donation pages for the family. Odessa had barely left any room for discussion. 
this was something she was going to do for the internet. And PD was going to do whatever she asked for the test. Not willing to press her further, PD complied. PD soon found himself hard at work researching everything he could about these individuals, pulling images from the internet and public accounts, finding testimonies in their local papers, and even making attempts to call the families of the victims for quote. He had hoped that they'd be more willing than willing to contribute, but a lot of them shut him out. Even if Odessa had proven success in some of her videos, some parents were still put off by the idea of a drag queen taking such an interest in their dead children. The few who did contribute merely sent in photos and statements. Not one agreed to come be in the video. Of course, as time passed, more parents seemed willing to comply. It even started to reach the point where if someone died, their friends and family would reach out to them before PD or Odessa had a chance to see the news story. PD had to start sorting through emails and private messages asking for Odessa to talk about kids killed in Maine, Oregon, Washington, DC, and more. One person had even messaged from Canada asking them to make a tribute for her dead friend. Another sent them footage of their brother from Manchester and even included pictures from, their dead, from the dead boy's funeral. Odessa's tribute videos were now making up more than half of her content on her YouTube channel now. And no matter what, Odessa seemed to insist that she and PD make these videos the priority over editing her performances from pageants or about the TV show she had done guest spot in. PD watched as the newest video finished exporting to the computer. On that video, Odessa had spoken about Tiana Allison, a trans woman of color from Mississippi who had been bludgeoned to death in an alley in Jackson. PD had spent part of yesterday pulling images from her social media account. He saw pictures of her trying on party dresses and dressing rooms, showing off new jewelry, and of her hanging out at a barbecue with some of her friends. He had them all in a folder, along with a document composed of statements and quotes about her. It would be a long night of editing the video of Odessa talking about her, along with all these photos and texts. But then again, PD was almost a pro at making these tribute videos. Okay, girl, I'm ready, Odessa said to PD. He looked over to her. She was now wearing a blonde wig styled in a large bun with a black jeweled hairband. Her gold dress had been traded out for a pale blue gown with a high collar and silver stones around the bust and sleeves. How do I look? She asked. Pretty good. Just pretty good, she chuckled. Pretty and good, PD said, smirking. They had had this exchange about a dozen times before. Good. Now tell me about this next kid. Okay, give me a second, PD said. PD closed a folder for Tiana and opened another one, clicking on the document. Odessa leaned over his shoulder to read the information on screen. Okay, this next one is for Sandy Esposito, PD began to read out. Age 17, found dead in Corpus Christi, shot several times, was a member of his school's soccer team and active in his church. And we're sure he's gay? His boyfriend said all of this. Perfect. Is it though? PD gave Odessa, Odessa gave PD a look, the kind where prickles traveled up his neck as a result, and he had to replay the last thing he said over and over in his mind. Yes, PD, because now we can show these sons of bitches what happens if you kill members of our community. All right, PD said, unplugging the camera from the theater. I just wouldn't use the words like perfect to describe it. You know what I mean. Now let's go. Odessa walked over to the stool and sat back down as PD saw the camera. Do you think we maybe want to slow down a bit on these videos? PD asked, checking over the camera saying, I mean, this one and Tiana's will make five this month. I think the fact that five LGBT teens have been murdered in a month is the reason why, Odessa said, glancing over the corner mirror to double check her look. Times have changed and it's clear the conversation has turned into a bloody one. Yeah, I get that, but it just seems like a lot of work and Percival Damien, Odessa said, saying PD's full name and knowing how much he hated it. I don't care. If you need a break, you can take a weekend off once you get both these videos off. Lord knows another teen's probably gonna get murdered before we know it. So let's do these videos before people forget Tiana and Sandy. PD nodded. It still surprised him to see that Odessa could be serious and angry at times. But then again, it shouldn't have surprised him to know she had such issues with all these murders. He glanced down at the rope burn marks on her wrists and ankles, still there no matter how much jewelry and bronzer she hoped would cover them up. Part of him surmised long ago that she, he should just let her have this. Now, considering there's going to be a lot of hateful shit about these kids by people who wanted them dead, she continued quickly powdering her face. Let's just put something good out on the internet, at least while we have a moment to breathe. Edie nodded. Okay, the camera's ready. Do you want to count down? One sec, turn the camera around. <laughs> Still not sold on your look? No, I am. I just want to make sure it looks good in this lighting. PD turned the monitor back as Odessa began to tilt her head and study her appearance. Okay, mama's slaying, she said, rubbing her wrists as she adjusted her posture. Count me down, babe. PD raised his fingers, began to count down from four to one. Once he hit one, he pointed at Odessa and she began to speak. Hello, my name is Odessa Arlington. And today, 
I want to tell you about an angel named Sandy. It was the same intro as all her videos, only with the name of the video subject swapped out. Sandy Esposito was the oldest of three kids in Corpus Christi. He had been playing soccer ever since he was five and even made it to his high school team as a forward. He had a 3.4 GPA and was planning to play soccer in college while also studying engineering, as he had hoped to be a civil engineer if he couldn't make the national team. In his spare time, he volunteered at his local church, assisting with the vacation Bible school program every summer. He did all this while being supported by his loving parents, his precious sisters, and his adorable boyfriend, Charlie. Odessa paused. PD could see she was preparing herself for the next part of the speech. He would have to edit the pause out, but in her eyes, PD could see Odessa was mentally preparing herself. Off camera, she was stroking the marks on her wrists. Last week, someone drove up to Sandy as he was walking home from school and shot him several times before driving off. Police have yet to find the assailant, although there is an active manhunt at the time of this recording. Sandy was dead when paramedics arrived. While it's not certain if Sandy's murder was an act of homophobia, according to some testimonies, Sandy and Charlie had both faced some bullying and discrimination at school and around their town. So police are treating this as a possible hate crime. What's truly a crime is that his death follows an unfortunate trend of attacks on members of our community. This person did not see Sandy as someone who cared about his school, his church, and his family. They saw him simply as an other, and they decided that was enough reason to murder him. Odessa adjusted herself in her seat and let out a long exhale. I've been informed that Charlie has set up a donation page to help the Esposito family with the funeral expenses. Here's a link to the page. Odessa pointed her fingers down to the space where PD would later add the URL to the donation page in the video. There's also a link in this video description, so please check it out and help. Please keep the Esposito family in your thoughts and remember that as long as these acts of unjust violence and cruelty happen in our community, we have to do whatever we can to ensure that people like Sandy will not be forgotten for the next generation and beyond. I'm Odessa Arlington, and this has been Odessa Remembers. Odessa paused and Petey nodded. Okay, we're good, he asked. Do you wanna take another, do you wanna do another take? No, I I'm good, Odessa said, reaching for a tissue off her table. She dabbed the area under her eyes. All right, I'm gonna get ready for tonight's show, Odessa said. Let's be ready to go in about 30 minutes. Odessa stood up and walked past PD to the dress rack. Okay, I'll be ready then. PD went back to the computer and began to upload the video. He looked over Odessa as she removed her wig and her gown. She was standing there in her undergarments and had lost her wig cap when she took the wig off. He could now see the scar on her back that Odessa said made wearing backless gowns quite troublesome. He then thought back to the article he found one night of random Googling while he was waiting for one of the Odessa Remembers videos to finish exporting. The article was about a teenager named Blake Hoffman who was abducted walking home from school one night. The article described how he was kept in a basement, tied up with ropes and abused by a group of dangerous men. How they chose him because of his eccentricities and camp behavior and wanted to punish him for that. How he was rescued after a neighbor reported suspicious behavior at the house how the rest of the country only gave a brief acknowledgement of the crime and then moved on. He turned back to his computer to see the progress of the upload. This is what Odessa had hired him to do, so he better get everything ready. After all, if the country was going to move on from the deaths of people like Sandy or Tiana or Brandon, they had to do their part to make sure it existed somewhere. And that's Odessa Remembers from Image Outright Volume 9. Thank you very much. Well, oh, thank you very much for reading the story. Um, yeah, wow, quite a performance. Mm. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Alex, for being on our show. Thank you. And for, mm -hmm. um, for people interested in the anthology, when you read the description of the show, you'll see links. And um, yeah, so stay tuned. I'm sure Alex has a lot more to offer as a book reviewer and a editor and a writer. Oh my goodness, you're very talented. Oh, yes, so I do. You. I have like four months of book reviews set. <laughs> Excited to get going on that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Alex. All right, thank you for having me, JF. This was really fun, and I'm very excited it was to. Fun, see. yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. For more upcoming episodes of the Artsy Raven about writing and publishing, visit us at jfgarrard.com/arpodcast. A reminder to Patreon subscribers that there is bonus content available for every episode on the Patreon website. If you enjoyed the show, you can show your appreciation by buying us some digital coffee. The Artsy Raven is produced by J.F. Garrard. The voice in the show's introduction is Chris Gorman, and music is by Tim Moore. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time, stay safe.